Welcome to episode number 251 of Destination Linux. Whether you're brand new to open source or a guru of sudo, this is the podcast for you. My name is Jill, and with me today we have the wonderful Michael AI, Michael, <laughs> we got Ryan and Noah. Also with us just off camera, but piped in directly from Jitsi is our glorious community of fact-checking, ego-busting patrons. Woohoo! And on this week's exciting episode of Destination Linux, we are going to discuss what made us Linux enthusiasts. Then we're going to discuss some good news with Firefox's latest release. It seems if they've been listening that they've been listening to Destination Linux. Plus, we have our tips, tricks, and software picks. All this and more coming up right now on Destination Linux to keep those penguins marching. So you may notice if you're watching the video version of this show that some of the cameras are going in and out. That's because Michael told me to upgrade the whole server just what? 30 minutes. Oh, maybe. I don't think that's how it happened. <laughs> As an Arch user, everyone knows when you ask me to maintain things, I'm going to roll updates as often as possible. I rolled some updates, some jitsy things changed, and uh, well, you may notice that throughout the show. Some of the videos pop in and out. It's just going to happen, but we're going to roll with it. It's still going to work. And the good news is the audio version will be perfect. But let's get into community <laughs> feedback. <laughs> We have an email this week from Russ, a really, really nice email. Russ has to say, Dear Destination Linux, I just wanted to express how much I really enjoy your show. I work weekends and cannot be a part of the live stream. I do, however, listen to it on my phone every weekend at work. I've been using <coughs> Linux for a couple of years and fell in love with it. And thanks to Destination Linux, I discovered services like Bitwarden and Proton Mail. I just received my official DLN mug, and I must say, you all were right. This thing is crafted so well, it holds any liquid you put in it. Any I mean, liquid. <laughs> that right even there just just tells you the kind of quality we put into our merchandise. Exactly. A cup that can hold any liquid. Any whatsoever any liquid out there i'm glad you tested that because we say it and i don't think people believe us that our mugs can hold all that liquid but they can <laughs> they totally uh, he can on, <laughs> he goes on to say i support you on patreon fyi it's the only contribution i have there so thank you very much for that it's extremely kind and i feel like destination linux is more to me than just a linux podcast but a place to hang out with my linux buddies to michael ryan jill and noah thanks again keep up the awesome work and as Jill always says, keep those penguins marching. I mean, Aww. when we're kicking off the holiday season, I felt it was necessary to read this email here to get everybody in a good mood. Russ, you rock. Thank you for You're putting awesome. all of us in a good mood. Like these emails. <laughs> yes. You know, we receive a lot of other emails sometimes too. So critiquing things or whatever is nice to get just an email. It's just like, thank you. Uh, we really do appreciate it. This is awesome. Great way to kick off the holiday season, I feel like. I also think that the holiday season is a, a perfect time to get a mug that you, you can prove you can prove to yourself that it holds a, any kind of liquid any you liquid. possibly want. Yeah. yeah, anything, whether it's cold liquid, hot liquid, it's gonna hold it. Check it out, dealinstore.com. So one of the things you'll notice is Russ got plugged into the community. He is taking advantage of the community resources, and he writes in to thank us for the community involvement. We want to hear from you, the community. The community is what makes the show up. So what we want you to do is send an email to comments at destinationlinux.org. Now, if you can't wait for the week-to-week -week, uh, show to come around to see if your comment made it and you want to start participating immediately, well, we have an option for you there as well. We invite you to go to dealinform.com, sign up for a free account, and start participating in the community immediately. This episode of Destination Linux is brought to you by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is proud to announce their app platform service, and they want you to come check it out. What is DigitalOcean's app platform service? It's a way for you to build modern cloud of cloud native apps for less money. With DigitalOcean's app platform service, you can build and deploy scale apps, websites faster, more intuitively, and more cost effectively. Now, all you have to do is connect your GitLab or GitHub account to their app platform, and DigitalOcean will do 
all the rest of the work. DigitalOcean does all the heavy lifting. It doesn't matter if you're on Node.js, Python, Go, PHP, Ruby, static sites, Docker, or container images with DigitalOcean's app platform, you're going to get lower costs, controlled infrastructure, and you own your data. Plus, it's all built on DigitalOcean's Kubernetes infrastructure, which means it's going to be a faster, smoother migration path and allowing you to take control of that infrastructure. Now, as you're a listener of the Destination Linux show and a member of the DLN community, they're going to give you a $100 credit to get you started. You can go to do.co slash DLN to take advantage of that $100 credit. What that's going to get you is $100 on DigitalOcean's platform. Now, you can use it for their app platform, or you could use it just to rent a couple of servers. If you've never managed anything before, this is your opportunity to do so, and we're going to get you started with that $100 free credit. So head over to do.co slash DLN to take advantage of that $100 free credit and a huge thanks to DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of Destination Linux. So I feel like Russ kicked us off perfectly with that very nice comment at the beginning and it rolls into this core story I wanted to talk about. We do this show because we're all enthusiasts. We love Linux all for very different reasons probably, but a lot of those reasons probably intertwine as well at the end of the day. We love the experience, the ecosystem, the users. So with that, I had a question in mind. What made you, the host here, enthusiast for Linux? Now, I don't want no broad, generic comment of, oh, I just love my, the community and all that. That's great. We know that. I want the specific thing that happened in Linux, because this kind of hit me this week when I was doing something, last couple of weeks, which I'll get into in mind, but I was doing something and I was like, I remember four years ago going across, coming across this for the first time. And it made me such an enthusiast. It was like that moment that really hit me that made me go, you know what? I'm Linux for life. This is my thing. This is my jam. And we asked that of our guests, but I've never really gotten that information from the host. So I'm going to start with you, Jill. Take me back. What is one of those moments in Linux, whether it was software, a desktop, a distro, something that you were doing that made you mm -hmm. go, man, this Linux thing is fire. So I realized actually to answer this question correctly, I needed to think about the evolution of Linux and all the early distros I played with when Linux was new to the world and to me. Right. And it, you know, this was at its birth. And I actually started with Slackware in 1993. I knew Slackware was going to come up somewhere. Our guests <laughs> always bring up Slackware, too. Yes. yes. <laughs> and because it was my first Linux distro, it has a very special place in my heart. And the big deal for me was getting 24 three and a half floppy disk images installed and working correctly on my 486. <laughs> okay, so if you take me back to that time, you have Windows was around during this time, correct, as well. And so yes. everything's being installed by floppy disk. Was 24, was it 24 floppy disk? Correct. <laughs> How many was a Windows 3.11 installation back then? Was it 24 too? It was like 12. 16. 12 or 13, yeah. So this was bigger than Windows. Yeah, this wow. was bigger than Windows. <laughs> so what was it about Slackware that made you so excited specifically? Well, getting, because it was the first, and here's what it boils down to. I installed an operating system that was open source and not big and GNU, as Linus Torvald says, and expensive like Unix. Because I had been using Unix and um, doing animation on Unix, but I didn't have fifty thousand dollars to install it on my computer at home. Wow! <laughs> or, understandably, or have a, yeah, understand. Or have a computer that would run it. <laughs> you know? So, for me, that was huge. And actually, uh, several people. This I got, I downloaded the floppy disk images from my my brother's uh, Leet BBS. A lot of people were saying they had issues with their CRT after afterwards because you can easily blow up your CRT in the process of going through the XF86 config file. If you don't make those settings right, like horizontal and uh, vertical. And also if you choose the wrong scan, hertz for your monitor, it could also the wreck hertz, the monitor. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. That was the yep. thing? 
if that you choose, was if you had like a, a thing. there was a there was a, I actually had an experience where I accidentally didn't brick it and learned that I could have because there was yeah. like a period of time where with CRTs there was a 59 hertz and there was a 60 hertz and the 60 hertz exactly. was super rare and the 59 was the more common thing and I put 60 because I assumed I had a better <laughs> monitor but it, I, um, I didn't even know what it meant I just I, I 60 sounds better than 59 so I'm gonna click that yeah. so I put it in and turns out my monitor was that and in the IRC chat rooms they were like you are so lucky you did not destroy your monitor <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you didn't take and, enough time to degauss it every once in a while. Yeah. And for everyone out there, if you don't don't know, it it's not it doesn't have anything to do with resolution. It's actually the the horizontal and vertical frequencies of the monitor, which is something you don't have to think about today. You just take it for take it for granted. Uh, you know, Linux knows what your monitor, all the specs of your monitor. Yeah. <laughs> So getting that installed was a big deal because I had had a new had peers that had issues with it. So I got it installed and was happily using my um, open source operating system, and it was just joy. You know, I, I learned how to uh, compile drivers <laughs> to in, install software and packages. And now is that uh, the first thing you did is just start working on the drivers and getting everything set up? Yes. And it, it was the excitement in that that it sounds like that you could do it yourself. Like you were yes. like, I did this. Right. I, <laughs> I figured it out. I sat there. You didn't have Google back then, dot com to go to or duck duck go, more importantly, uh, to go down and start searching up issues and things. So what did you do instead when you ran into an issue you got stuck at? You just had to work through it. You had to do it do it the hard way. I mean, some some I could get some help from the the BBS I was on. Uh, but yeah, like Ryan said, we did have text internet, but we didn't have, you know, the web. It was just coming that year. And, uh, so no, honestly, it was just a lot of trial and error. <laughs> That's how you had to, had, you had to learn the hard way. <laughs> it's funny you picked Slackware. I had no idea what you were going to pick as your thing, but we've heard so many guests who also came yeah. from that uh, generation of starting to get into computers and Slackware is mentioned nearly every time. If they well, because it's one of the first. Yeah, you know, it was uh, it was based off a of soft landing Linux, which is is one of the very first Linux distros. So Slackware is based off that. Very cool. And um, but again, it was hard for me to pick because after Slackware, um, once I got it all set up and configured, then I learned uh, about Debian. <laughs> <laughs> it's been love ever since. It's been love ever since. Yeah. So, and and with Debian, um, I started with that in 1994. And using the ints mod command to get a sound card module into the kernel to get sound to work was a real game changer for me. Because that literally meant that now I could use Linux in all of its multimedia glory. And I can play games like Doom, which was available for Linux. Nice. Uh, SimCity and Quake. And then later, the Loki software games came out thanks to Ryan C. Gordon. Mm -hmm. So I was listening to music using the Sox sound exchange program, and then later using um, um, the OS sound system in XMMS. <laughs> and, you know, from, from getting sound to work for me made Linux a first class citizen at that point. I had to work at it to get the sound working. But once it did, now I could use Linux for production. <laughs> and then later, later on in the in the '90s, it it was um, you were able to you know it would automatically recognize your uh, not just Sound Blaster cards but other manufacturers as well. We're all spoiled so. today, is what you're saying. Yes, yeah. exactly. I, I, yes, <laughs> yes. I, I feel it. Sometimes I'm thinking about it like you know these things could be better than I think back. You know, when I first started with Linux, and it was like, no, it's so different. Like, I'm I'm picking apart things that are just not a big deal, and we have Pipewire now and stuff like that. Like, yeah, uh, it's so it's so cool. Like, we ha we're in a <laughs> we're in a very nice era of Linux. It's and if you go back even amazing. just 10, 10, 15 years, there's uh, there was other things to deal with as well. And every day it gets yeah. better. Like just yesterday was announced the Battle Eye rolling into Proton. Yeah, so like and all, all you need is an games. email. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the games before that couldn't work because of BattleEye, the anti-cheat system. Now all the developers have to do is send an email and poof, they're going to work on Linux. I mean, mm -hmm. the things that change so rapidly 
we went from when I started in Linux to everyone's big thing was, oh, you can't game in it, so I'm not switching, or I'm going to dual boot because you can't game in it, to we've got literally everything now loading in Linux. Uh, it's quite incredible. All right, so same question. <laughs> Michael, what was it for you? So to answer that question, I kind of cheated. I have three answers to that question because it wasn't just an individual thing that made me excited to do it. It was the the options of multiple things that came out many years ago. And what's funny about it is that when I started in Linux, uh, I, I didn't really have my aha moment or my, you know, Linux is my favorite platform for many years. So I used Linux for... Uh, as a dual booting thing or on occasion for many years before I had that experience. But it was around uh, 2009 when uh, SUSE company created the SUSE Studio process. And this is a platform that was allowing you to build your own system, your own distro. You would base it on SUSE, but you could go in and create your own everything. Now, it's this is not a cop-out from your thing about everything's customization. This is a specific thing that okay. SUSE made where Cop you could out. go into a GUI that had click, point and click and choose different features of, 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 your, of your system and create your own distro based on your decisions and make an image That's from it. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And it also made it possible. So at, like in the beginning, it, it was essentially that. But later on, they made it possible to go into the actual, like cr create the modifications you want, boot that system on the studio, make changes inside of the desktop, and then save that as a build to deploy somewhere else. Like all you, like you, if you customized your DE, the customizations of that DE would be deployable. Like that was such a really awesome feature that uh, I, I kind of wish SUSE would bring that back because SUSE Studio was awesome and it I, 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 I do think it mm -hmm. needs to be back. Uh, the, the other one was a few years later and it was Unity from Canonical and Ubuntu. Now, a oh. lot of people did not like mm -hmm. Unity. They didn't like it for political reasons or they didn't like it because it was so different and that sort of stuff. But Unity had so many cool features that it could do. I mean, it had like it invented the HUD system, which it didn't actually invent the technology concept because I found it well actually to me it did. It introduced it to me. Then I found a couple years later that there was a prior work for that anyway. And the HUD system was essentially a way to manipulate an application without having to use the application or even knowing where the features were. So, for example, if you wanted to do a image editing in Inkscape and you wanted to open a tool or add a, a modification through a filter or something like that, instead of knowing where the menus were and finding and you know drilling down to the thing, you could just hit the Alt key. It pops up a little command box. You type in what you want to change. And then that's it. You're done. You've made the Unity, change. They they polished what already existed in a number of ways. Mm -hmm. I think Unity was actually very good, and I think that they. Uh, it's a shame that it's gone. Uh, just it's like it's so a shame that Sousa Studio. I know gone. I've said this before, but it's so fascinating to hear you all talk, and you guys have been consistent about Unity. When when I came in, it was the mm -hmm. most hated thing on the planet. Like literally, oh, everybody yeah. wanted it. No, gone. you know what? It wasn't. It's just the the vocal minority wanted to talk about that at, at, at how terrible Unity was. But the you know the truth was, if you looked at the multi monitor support of Unity compared to every other desktop environment at the time, Unity was far and away better. And if you looked at the overall user experience, the vast majority of people that sat down at a bunch of, um, um, say 1204 on uh, box viewed very much that box, that environment was very much Mac like from the standpoint that Canonical had a vision, they had a design philosophy, they tweaked it and polished it to a T and then they iterated on it. And so the biggest complaint that people had is, Oh, it's another version and there's still nothing new and there's no, yeah. But what is there works flawlessly all the time, consistently, predictably, and all of those kinds of things. Now today, I think we've kind of gotten there with Gnome and with KDE, but at the time unity was, was like the same place to start from. And it was frustrating at the time that people just complained about it constantly I think the reason for that was was the 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 reason 
that Canonical went to switch for it. And uh, Michael, I'm sure you have some thoughts on that, but they did their, their timing of going to, hey, this is where we're going to revamp Unity and Goat says it couldn't have been worse because they timed it right when Microsoft was doing the same thing with their desktop environment. And so people had no place of stability. Well, I mean, that was uh, there was a, a stability issue, but I don't think it was because of the Microsoft thing. I think the problem with it is is that when they decided to do it, the reason they decided to do it was misconstrued by a lot of people in the community about, you know, hey, they're just trying to do their own, you know, not invented here thing, and they're just trying to make their own thing. The reason they were doing it is because GNOME was getting rid of GNOME two and creating GNOME three. And the problem with that is that they just in this period of time, which was 2010, 2011 is when this this transition happened. Gnome decided we're going to make a new version of Gnome. Fair enough. That's a reasonable thing to do. If you want to make a better version, more modern version, do that. But they decided we're going to make a new version and stop working on the other one at the same time, which means the new version doesn't exist yet and is not ready. So, uh, so there was like a period of like a couple years where GNOME was in- unusable for like at least two or three years, maybe it was just unusable. Like GNOME three was broken. GNOME two was basically dead. And so the period of like, no, of, of, of Ubuntu going, well, what do we use now? Do we have, so then in the period of, um, of KDE at the time was the first, like Plasma came out in 2008. So this was like the first, like the, there was a couple issues with Plasma in the very beginning for the same kind of thing of creating new, uh, a new interface, a new desktop, having some, you know, you know, growing pains and that sort of stuff. So there was a period of like, what do they choose? Do they choose uh, Plasma that's having some issues currently? Or do they choose GNOME that's going to have issues for a while? Or do they choose something that's XFCE that it's based on uh, GTK2, which was no yes. longer being maintained at all? Yes. As, yeah. a, as a company, you don't pick something that's oh. not being maintained anymore. I just like XFCE, so I, I wanted to throw that I in. do think XFCE has a lot of potential now, of course, but at the time, I understand their decision not to do it. Now, other people I've seen in the community say something like, why did they not choose Mate? Why did they not choose Cinnamon? Why did they not choose Insert Other Thing? Because they didn't exist. Cinnamon wasn't a thing. Mm-hmm. Mate wasn't yep. a thing for a couple <laughs> years. Uh, and other things like that, uh, it just, they weren't things. And the same the same issue that XFC had is the same issue that LXDE had, which eventually LXDE created LXQt anyway, so it didn't really matter. So the options were very, very limited to why they made Unity in the first place. Which had features, by the way, Unity likes fractional scaling. Yes. Imagine yes. that, ahead of its time, <laughs> before even Windows got it right, before Mac got it right. Unity had it, and we're still struggling to this day with some of those features on desktop mm-hmm. environments and today. U- Unity had it very still do not have too. proper fractional scaling, but yep. Unity did. Like they were ahead of their time in a big way, in they a were. lot of ways. And, and and here's the thing that's actually kind of funny. This is a stuff that I've never. T- I don't think I've ever talked about it on the show before. But there was a period of time where Unity could have been amazing, even more so than people th- knew knew it was. You know how good it was. Um, there was a period in 2012, and actually 1204, which, by the way, if you download 1204, you can you can still try it out in a virtual machine or whatever because you still can get those, which is another thing about Linux, which is, is awesome, is because you can still get whatever version you want. Even if you want to get the version 0.9 from Red Hat, you could get that, um, yes. So, <laughs> which came with Doom, by the way. Now, you could get uh, you can get the 1204 version, which is an LTS. However, there was there was a mistake that Canonical made, which is retrospectively a mistake, but at the time I didn't really realize it. Uh, it was going to be so bad. But they made two different versions in 1204. They made a GTK oh, yeah. version and they made a Qt version. Cute, the, yeah. I used the Qt version and it was <laughs> awesome. It was way better than the GTK version. And that's not because I was a Qt fan. I wasn't even aware that it was Qt until later. So... This was, I just, I think it was better. It was smoother. It was, it used less resources and all these things. It was better. The reason why it didn't get successful is because people didn't use it, they said. Why did they not use it? Because the GTK version was called 3D and the cute version was called 2D. Yeah. <laughs> That's why right. Why yes. would you do that? <laughs> I remember that. Of course they're going to pick 3D because <laughs> they want the 3D because uh, it seems like it's better, right? 
So oh, going for 4D if I'm going to pick one. But let's get 40. back on the yeah, track yeah. of what made you excited. I hear all your frustration. No, 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 no. I'm saying <laughs> this is not a frustration. He was excited about the frustration. This is not oh, a frustration. Okay. This was what Typical made Linux. me excited because I saw yeah. all the different options and I play with it. And it gave me – this was early. This was like a year into Unity when I saw the 12, the 12.4 Qt version. And, and I saw other v- features that you could do. And also there was a thing that people didn't know that the HUD – wasn't just built for your uh, applications. It also controlled your system. So if you wanted to hit Alt, type in Shut, you could in, you could shut down your computer just from that. If you wanted to do reboots, you could do the same thing. It allows you to use uh, any kind of uh, menu system integration with everything a part of the of of, of Unity cool. and everything a part of the system. Which is why one of the reasons why I liked Unity. And there's a lot of other things that just made Unity great, like. The dash was a really cool idea that people eventually kind of copied. Mm -hmm. There was uh, a lot of, of, I mean, there was some issues, of course. Everything has issues. That's how it works. But I'm going to say something that will definitely get some comments. (laughs) The way that they did uh, screen real estate management in Unity, very good. So left side close buttons and minimize buttons and maximize buttons are okay. And in fact, the way <laughs> Unity did it, they're good. They're <laughs> so the gone too far this time, Michael. Yeah. You've gone too Aww. far. Too I'm far. sorry. I kind, I'm of, so- I kind of agree with you, Michael. Send your email uh, to you, comments Jill. at Destination I, Thank you, Jill. Because <laughs> uh, so- I often change my theme so that I have the minimum maximize on the left-hand side because it's quicker. Yeah. I mean, you're a lot of the times. Never felt so betrayed by two friends before. A lot of the times, your mouse is on the left side anyway because of the right to the left to right reading thing that we do, right? So yeah, there it's it's kind of more efficient. But the reason why it was actually efficient is because they had the panel at the top and they had the launcher on the left. So you're always on the left anyway. So having the close buttons and stuff right there just made it all in this nice organized position. But when you maximized, it moved the panel. Or it moved the uh, window configuration stuff, like the the menu into the global menu. It moved the close buttons in the top left, which means the title bar is not wasting any space. It's now sitting inside of the panel. So you're optimizing the screen real estate in a massive way, and it's just awesome. And then they did even better stuff when they created the local integrated menus, where instead of a global menu at the very top... It still hid the menu, but it hid it inside of the title bar of that particular window. So you just hover over the title bar, and then boom, your menu show. There's so a lot of so great many cool things about setup. Unity. From yeah, the beginning totally. So Unity is that moment for you? Uh, no, Unity and SUSE Studio, uh, and also another one that's um, which I'll, I'll I'll share later because I want to I want to get into yours. I mean, I assume. Yours is relevant to Arch in some way, just because I just assume it at this point. Just like how you you you're, you're not <laughs> that surprised. Is so you're rude, not surprised sir. that Slackware was Jill's. <laughs> <laughs> that is so rude. But you know what? Before we get to me, and then you could share that story. I want to know what Noah's moment was. Noah. <laughs> so it's interesting. You talk about having a moment, and I can relate to that actually fairly well. I was working at a medical software company at the time. And we had a process known as professional development. And the idea behind professional development was uh, you could take any piece of equipment, whether it was designed for a customer or we bought it to do research and development in-house. And you could do basically whatever you wanted to do with that equipment. And it's actually it's a policy I like so much that I've actually kept it uh, today. This is how we operated Alta Speed Technology. So we let people do this, right? We let our technicians take so customer orders a $40,000 p- uh, server and it comes in. Uh, any Alta Speed technician can load whatever operating system they want, whatever software they want, and they can just explore that technology. And what that allows you to do is, first of all, it gives you personal ownership in that technology. And so you start to learn and put hands on it and care about it because you're engaged in whatever that piece of equipment or whatever that piece of software is. So had this policy back when I worked at a different company and took a server that came in that we were going to deploy with Windows 2000 server. Now, if you remember Windows 2000 server, it had a very uh, unique problem. It would assign the same IP addresses to multiple uh clients on the network, which is a problem when you're, when your job on the it network to be is a to problem. assign yeah. a, unique, a unique address to every client so that they can talk efficiently. And so it didn't do that. And the way that we had gotten, a, a, we've 
we got about that the way that my predecessor, my boss had said, well, you just restart this computer every so often and then windows will come back up and then it will be fine. And that worked. Um, but that meant that we had these 30 day cycles where we were just restarting windows servers. And so I take the server home and I don't have the money to load a copy of windows servers. So I go on the internet and I find a copy of red hat and download a copy of red hat, put it on the server and I load it up and set it up as a DHCP server, set it up with DNS. Um, and install the software that we were using at work at the time. And we get that loaded and it's working flawlessly. And I go 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and it just keeps working better and better. So I go back into the office and my boss says, Hey, 30 days is coming up. And that was the end of the PD where you had to bring it back in. So it could actually get deployed to the client to wherever it was going to go. So he says, Hey, uh, you got that server, your PD is up in 30 days. So we need to bring it back. I said, no problem. And I said, um, you know, it's funny. I downloaded this piece of software off the internet and it is, it's been running for almost three months and no problems. Didn't crash. Doesn't have to do cheap here. But it all works really well. It's just kind of crazy, isn't it? It didn't run for three months like that. Mm, yeah, it did. Really? Bring it back in here. Show us. So I bring it back and we take it to the lab. We set it up in a lab environment and reload the thing. And I walk my boss through the process and we let it run. 30 days comes up when we're going to take it out to the client and it's still working and it works flawlessly with the software we're use, using. So my boss says, go put that into production. I want you to send it out as is. That's way better than what we're doing right now. Let's go ahead and send that out. And I said, Hey, Hey, this is a thing I downloaded off the internet. Like I have no idea how to use this thing. We should not put this into a client location. I don't think that's a good idea at all. And if it does break, don't come to me because I just, again, download it off the internet. And he goes, no, this is what I want you to do. So we do that. And it runs for six months, no problem at the client location. And I got to a point, go back to my boss's office and says, hey, this is kind of what's happening. Like it's gone six months and this, this isn't here, but I'm not comfortable with this. And that was a point where I said, okay, well, we're going to go get you some training. So they paid soup the nuts to, um, to get professional training so I could get my head wrapped around more about this Linux thing that I installed. But early on, when you say, what was that magic moment? What was the moment that just that, that solidified in your mind? Hey, this is the thing. And then from that springs fire. This is what I care about. This is, this is fun. One of my least favorite phrases, and I hear people in the community say this all the time. They say, well, it's just a tool. It's, it's, it's just a tool. No. And that is, that could not be further from the truth. Yes, it is a tool. And yes, we do use tools to accomplish tasks. But at the end of the day, what you're really talking about is making a decision. And if you're making a decision strictly on the technical merits, then you're not factoring in your own value system in. And in my value system, I care about my time. I care about the, the technology aspect of it is one thing. The technical proficiency of it is one thing. But when you evaluate Linux on any one individual plane, you don't try to combine them all together and create a false narrative. And we compare apples to oranges. When we compare one Technical train one train at a time. We say, okay, from a technical perspective, is it built as good as it can be? Okay, yes, up and down the stack. Windows was primarily designed as a personal computer, right? And so when you had a individual localized single solid out there machine and you load it with a piece of software, Windows worked okay in that environment. Once you brought it into a network environment and you expected it to play well with others, there was a number of different issues. Linux, on the flip side, was created from the ground up as a network operating system. It was designed to play well with others. And the modularity and individuality of Linux means that you have the person that cares so much about the Linux networking stack that that's all that guy lives, eats, and breathes. And he designs a Linux networking stack. And that's over here. It is the best it can be. And then you go over here and say, well, what do we need for desktop environment? Well, guess what? Actually, turns out there's a whole bunch of people that have different ideas on the best way that you can create a Linux desktop environment. So you get KDE and you get GNOME and you get XFC and you get a different flavor for everybody out there that's looking for something. And then you combine all of those best of in-class technical trains. And what you arrive with is a very good, not perfect, very good solution all around. And what what we've seen is over time, you've watched those two models grow. You've watched Microsoft, who's just said, hey, I'm going to hire all these developers and I'm going to pay them a bunch of money. And I, every year I want something new and I want something better and I need something great. And so for a long time, we went Windows 3.1 to Windows 95, improvement, 95 to 98, improvement, 98 to SE, improvement to 2000, SE. That was kind of the pinnacle, right? Yeah. Then we went to XP and we all looked at it and went, what is this Fisher Price looking piece of junk thing? 
<laughs> and that and but really though, I mean there was there was a there was a a real question about that in the in the professional IT environment at that time. And this is the time where Linux starts to get more stable, it starts to get rolled out in large, large companies, massive deployments inside of server stuff like that. And you're you're starting to see this shift. And over the next 10 to 15 years, what you watched was those things that excited me. And I looked and went, how is this hacked together piece of junk doing what we paid thousands of dollars over here for this company to do? And this thing does it better. Why is that? And as more people started to ask that question and go, holy Hannah, it turns out if we actually put our, 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 our bets over here in this bank, it actually does the thing. And you'll notice that the number one complaint about Linux in 2021 and really for the last five years, has not been a technical train complaint. It has been a social complaint because large companies choose to produce their product, write their code and release on these platforms over here. We somehow fault Linux for not having the support or the ability to do those things over there. And if anything proves that the steam, uh, the steam deck and right. that massive just 180 whoop, like that overnight shows us that Linux can technically compete on mm. the same trains that all of these other platforms. They just haven't been given a fighting chance. And so I believe that Linux is technically capable of doing all of these things. And 15 years later, I'm still using the same piece of software to manage all my recipes in my kitchen on my Linux based computer that I installed 10 years ago uh, that I'm doing today. Why? Community, open source, freedom, security, stability. And those are values. And I choose my software based on values. So when you ask me, how do I get fired up? Why do I get fired up? Why do I believe Linux? I just wish you would system? get fired I up mean, when I'm on, asking. I mean, so timid right now. You know, it would be so low energy all the time, Noah, you know, well, about hey, Linux. It would this, is what, so this, timid. this is why. This is why. <laughs> no, I love that. I think that's very, yeah. very powerful. Noah, what you were saying about the Steam Deck, I really think it is it is kind of revolutionizing the Linux desktop. It is, it is um, you know, getting gaming into the hands of, yeah, the consu the average consumer. And by the way, no one used huge. that as an example as somebody who's not a gamer, doesn't sit around yeah. and game, doesn't dream about game, doesn't want to hang out and game all the time, but still realizes that this is a game changer for Linux. And uh, I think yes, a lot of people literally. are in your same boat, <laughs> Noah, where they're not big gamers <laughs> Um, but yeah. I think it's that realization that you have that even though you're not, you know, this is bringing a whole new audience into the Linux ecosystem, which is cool. So, Ryan, tell us your stories <laughs> about your joy so, of Linux. I mean, for me, I've really enjoyed hearing <laughs> you all stories because you've been in Linux so much longer. And for me, I've, I'm, I'm more on the recent. So I didn't have the whole having to compile and build all your own stuff and all of that pain uh, that you all journeyed through and still stuck with Linux, which shocks me. I think it's amazing. But I got to also remember that there really weren't fantastic alternatives out there either at that time, because Windows 3.11 and those things, you would fight with drivers constantly too. So it wasn't like unique to Linux. For me, it was really the privacy thing. I remember um, starting out and doing some videos on privacy and security, and I, I was doing them in Windows. And it was like, I kept going through these menus deeper and deeper, like, oh, you've got to do this in Windows 10, and then you've got to go through all these settings, then you got to go into this internet dashboard, and then you got to go into the registry and start editing these things you don't understand to start turning off all these privacy features. And it was mm -hmm. really getting annoying. And then you guys know the story. Somebody recommended uh, Tails and things to me, and that was kind of the rest was history, and I started digging into Linux from there. So for me, it was kind of a privacy start. But the moment where I felt like this is my jam. There are two things. One was it was the XFCE desktop environment, which to this day is still my favorite desktop environment. It's just when I boot it up, when it comes up, I feel home immediately because yeah. it was the first one that I really learned. But it was Arch, Michael. Darn you for guessing. <laughs> Arch to me represents the very best out of what I want out of an operating system. I don't want to have to go hunt down for software, especially when I'm doing shows, because very early in my Linux career, I was invited to do a podcast on Linux. So I didn't want to have to go find and search for software and find some PPA that didn't quite work and all this stuff. And I had the AUR with Arch. So that was a big deal with me. And to this day, I can still go to the AUR, get any software that I want near immediately and be ready to go. And for me, that's very important. Number two, it was the configuration. I want the most speed. 
I want that I can get out of my machine. And I needed, especially at that time, to really understand a little more about the inner workings of Arch. And during that install, which everyone wants to avoid, which really isn't as difficult as people make it to be, but using things like CF desk, disk and knowing how to set up your partitions correctly and all of those type of things really helped me understand how Linux works. And then when I got to a desktop, had no audio, had no GPU drivers, had nothing set up because nothing's done for you. Like when you do an Ubuntu install or you do a Fedora install where it's all done for you and handled, I had to go figure out those packages and I enjoyed the heck out of that. So in a way, I guess I was time traveling back to experience what you guys yeah, enjoyed exactly. with setting up your machine. And Jill, when you mentioned yeah. no audio, I actually was doing a pure Arch install on the HP Omen, had no audio and found that it's the Ulsa Dash firmware driver that fixed it. So I know that feeling you yeah. mentioned of having no audio, yeah. you find that driver that fixes it and then boom, everything starts working. To me, that's very exciting, but Arch gives me everything I want. It oh. is fully customizable to what I need. I'm only putting in the packages and I control it all. And I did a year and a half for those who haven't been listening to this show the entire time, a year and a half of running pure arch on my machines. I had less failures. Michael, tell me I'm not wrong than the rest of every host on the show would have coming <laughs> in on Sundays. So when people say it's not stable, they're not telling oh. the truth. And yeah. let's let's be fair to everyone who he is in disagreement with about it being stable or not stable. Let's also remember that Ryan changes nothing and takes whatever <laughs> default is given to him of everything. So it's not true. I it's it is wallpaper. It, 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 no, so there you go. He does change this wallpaper. So yes. it is easier when you change absolutely nothing. But if anybody who like, yes. likes the idea of the customization of the system. Uh, his, I like his, it's the way God your, built it. Your, your experience may vary. Uh, so he's more of a Walmart Linux user than I am. Yes. <laughs> but in Ryan's defense, it's because he updates f frequently on Arch. That's that, true. That's why it doesn't break. Yeah. I mean, I, I also, he, the, he, the he likes to do distro hopping, so he has a new install of Arch every three days. Uh, so. Garuda. I follow the rules of, you know, looking at the Arch release notes to make sure there's nothing I think would impact. And then I do my updates weekly and everything runs very smoothly in Arch. Do you have to stay on top of it? Do I recommend it for everybody? Of course not. But Arch is amazing. I think it's beautiful. I'm so glad Steam chose it because I think it does highlight yeah. the best performance you can get. And at a time when Windows was kicking Linux's butt all over the place and I'm building these powerhouse machines trying to prove that Linux can actually game faster, this is pre-Steam Proton and all this stuff, Arch allowed me to do all of these strange configurations and overclocking to make Linux win in those videos benchmarks. So thank you, Arch, for that. Yeah. I I, I think it's interesting. Because I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be like, the anti-Arch person, because I'm not anti-Arch. I just think there's a different, there's a debate to be had about the way that people present Arch. And also there's a debate to be had about whether or not the choice by by Valve is the better option it for is. it to be. I mean, we can debate this if you want to, but I think we should save it for another show because that is interesting and I, but I, and I do want to go into it, but I do think it feel. I feel like it'd be a, a very long conversation. Yeah. Plus, you would lose, and you don't want to lose uh, twice yeah, on the yeah, same uh, show. I mean, yeah, I don't, continue on. How, <clears throat> when did I lose already in the first place? What are you talking about? I don't know. Um, I'll pick something out. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there is a lot of good things that Arch has, and there are some interesting things, and there is a story for me that it. I do like the like I All the right. way right. the question the question. Let it you, out, Michael. Don't no. Hold on. <laughs> Michael, the question Michael you, AI, AI, go to work. <laughs> no, the question you asked about whether or not, uh, and like what do, you, know, you, the question you asked about, like what is your moment? I definitely feel like I cheated because I have so many moments, and I'm, I'm now coming up with another one. Uh, but this one is based on the experience of the Arch because I had a similar thing of saying like, oh, I can customize all of this stuff. But I also have a a, a, a characteristic of I don't want to. And uh, I liked having, you said like, you know, have Ubuntu do it for you or Fedora do it for you. I like the, you know, do it for me kind of thing. Yeah. But I also want to customize stuff as well. And I want to do it in a, you know, a very 
specific way. When I when I say customize, I'm an Arch fan. That you're going long ways to say one line. I that's Go not ahead. what I'm. That's not <laughs> what I'm going to say. So what happened was, is you know how uh, I like customization and I do like, and I go in deep. Like when I customize something, I go in deep. That's why I'm a huge fan of Plasma because I can do so much stuff with Plasma. And it's similar to how you like XFCE. You can do a ton of stuff okay. with XFCE. Yes, we get it. I don't like the process of having to build Arch in general. So when Intergos came out, I was super excited to play with this. So for those who don't know what Intergos is, it was like the predecessor of Endeavor OS, which is currently sim- very similar. Uh, Intergos was also a project that I joined as a main team contributor to work yeah, on there this. There was arch blood that flowed there, through your veins. There's a, yes. li- there's a little bit of it. Okay, it's not. I'm not saying I don't like arch. I just think that arch is not for beginners. And we, every time we say arch, yay, we yes, also need to say not for beginners, <laughs> but. Uh, I also for smart like, beginners, yes, you can use Arch. <laughs> if you're not a smart no, beginner, if, then you if can't. You're, if you're a Windows power user, you're still not a power user for Linux in any way whatsoever. So Go it, back it, to your story about you loving Arch. I, I'm not, <laughs> that's not what I was saying. I'm just saying that uh, Intergos was something that gave me a excitement that I, I, I could have my cake and eat it too, so to speak. Oh. I could have the Arch speed and the arch control Uh but not have to manually do it however when i joined the team and i started helping others manually do it i realized that kind of like contradicted my own a reason to do it in the first place but it was cool because i i helped maintain the kde version for intergos uh so that just the long story short of it is i do think there are some great parts of arch Mm-hmm. But I also want to um, say that uh, I don't want to do all of it. <laughs> Your experience is you fell in love with Intergos and rightfully so. So much so that you went and jumped in and helped maintain the KDE version of it. And to this day, you are a arch lover that just doesn't want to admit it publicly. Got it. No, that's not, so, that's not at all what, what I'm heard saying. Too. <laughs> that's not at all what I'm saying. In fact, if you think about it, all the stuff that I listed off uh-huh. don't exist anymore. So everything Michael likes dies. So don't like Arch. No. Oh. <laughs> okay. That we okay. That's a, that's a weird pers- a way to take that. What I'm saying, I think that it, the the coolest thing about Linux, and the reason why I was showing all, sharing all these things, and the reason I specifically talked about the things that don't exist anymore, is because f- is because uh, Linux is a platform that continuously gives me those moments. It continuously gives me the aha stuff of like. Oh, here's this really cool thing that I can play with and a really cool thing that I can enjoy. And the same this was the same experience I had with Plasma. Plasma wasn't the first time I had that experience, but it was it happened and it happened around the same time that I did with Intergos. Because I switched to Intergos and then like probably six months or maybe a couple months later, I switched to Plasma. And it was the same kind of aha moment of wow, Plasma is way better than I thought it was. And, you know, that kind of thing. Because there's always these kinds of people talking about, like, you know, saying that they've heard something. Like, Ryan has said this, and I've I've actually repeated this on so many occasions because it was such a great point. And don't tell Ryan I said this, but... So, Ryan made a really great point about people have an experience with something and then kind of create an opinion but never revisit that opinion, never revisit the actual project or the software or the whatever, and then have like years later pass by and still have that same opinion, but it's completely voided now. But they're not willing to consider it in in many cases. And as soon as he said that, I started reassessing everything. I started reassessing the fact that like I hadn't used Fedora in a while, and now I use Fedora as my daily driver because I'm like, oh, it's way better Changed now. Everything, yeah. yeah, and it's it's and there's so many different factors of that, and it's just it's interesting because I think that one of the things that I love about Linux is that that it's a continuous process of getting those uh, those aha moments. And I, I love that. I don't think you could yeah. end the segments better than that. That I want to hear from the community your aha moments. So go to our discourse forums and share with us your aha moments that you've had with Linux where you're like, this is it, this is my jam, I'm here forever, and any of the Mm -hmm. art stories I will pin to the top as a moderator. (laughs) (laughs) Of course. 
This episode of Destination Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get started right now with your free account at bitwarden.com slash DLN. Bitwarden is an awesome piece of software because it is a password manager that allows you to have peace of mind knowing that your online accounts are secure. How does it do it? Well, it gives you a lots of different tools, but the most important tool is to be able to have multiple passwords and be able to have a different password for every single website, but that, that can be a, ma- a hard thing to manage. So it gives you a password vault to store all of your passwords in, and it will also generate those passwords automatically for you so you don't have to worry about what the passwords are, where they're stored, or even have having to fill them in because it will automatically fill those passwords in on login forms so you don't have to do any of this stuff plus you have access to, to the data across many different types of devices like your web browser your mobile apps desktop application or even on the command line and bitwarden seals and encrypts your data with end-to-end encryption before it ever leaves your devices which means it's doing it locally. So any of the data that has been sent over the internet, which will still have end-to-end encryption, but at the same time, it will be gibberish regardless. So there's many layers of making it as safe as possible. So go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started. And did I mention you can get started for free? Well, you can, but I also think you want to check out their premium account because they are just fantastic features starting at less than a dollar per month. That's right. That's not a typo. I didn't say that wrong. It's less than a dollar per month. It gets you one gigabyte of encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F, Duo, Vault Health Reports, Bitwarden Authenticator for temporary one-time passwords, priority customer service, and so much more. So make the smart move like many of the community have and go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started with your Bitwarden account. And thanks again to Bitwarden for sponsoring Destination Linux. So previous episode of Destination Linux, we talked about uh, a, a piece of software that we were people think that we were a little bit uh, harsh on in our coverage, and that was related to Firefox. And our intention was to help a friend of the open source world to in, uh, improve and also stop the issues that we saw at the time. It wasn't to be bashing Firefox in any way, but one of the suggestions we made to Firefox was to focus on privacy and security security features and also just focus on making cooler features in Firefox to give incentive for people to use it. And I'm happy to say that it seems like they were listening so some of the developers have take, taken a hint for Firefox 94, and there are a lot of exciting new features. There are new features just in general, but there's also new security and privacy features, which is fantastic. So, I mean, they also probably work on Firefox, you know, more than a couple of weeks ago, but we're going to take credit for it anyway, because I just want to. Uh, <laughs> so with this release, there's a lot of new stuff. For example, with the power users, you can now use something called about colon unloads. This will be able to to release system resources by manually unloading tabs without having to close them. This is something that I use in this really weird workaround way where I, I if I'm using a particular thing and I have it, I used to do it a lot more, but I had tons of tabs. I would close my browser, reopen it, and there's a setting you can do in your preferences where if you have not activated the tab, it will not load it on the restart. So I would do this through that method and now they're actually building it into Firefox for on purpose to do this. That's and that cool. is awesome. I like it. Yeah. They also have done performance here for specific hardware on Linux specifically. Remember, one of our feedback pieces was give more to the community that's been supporting you all along from the very beginning. And here we get some improved WebGL performance and reduced power consumption for users specifically of AMD and Intel GPUs using the Mesa stack. And if you followed this long enough and you took my advice and went AMD, you're welcome. Uh, (laughs) But there's something cool in the NVIDIA camp. The NVIDIA uh, 495 driver that just came out does support this WebGL performance. Um, They enable GBM, the Generic Buffer Manager API, over EGL. In, in those drivers. Jill, don't bring facts in here when I'm bragging. Please, <laughs> just let, let my bragging go. Then bring in the facts. <laughs> like, I uh, no, it's a really good point. I'm teasing you. Yeah, yeah, 495 just landed, and I was very excited. I tested that out. <laughs> mm-hmm. it's, it's it's also available in a lot of the districts already. And there's, some are still working on getting support, <laughs> but if you can get the access to it, try it out, because it does improve the support the performance for that as well. And another thing that I am super excited about, about it is the way I've ta- we've talked about it before because they have been working on this in 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 the back end on the like the beta channel and nightly channel and stuff like that. But I am so happy to 
see this coming because they have introduced something called site uh, site isolation, which essentially mm-hmm. is to uh, fight against attacks like side channel attacks such as Spectre and that kind of thing. And what it does is essentially create a, you know how there's a, a lot of browsers have this thing where they have a different uh, process per tab or a site isolation takes that and turns it a little bit in, like a more security to it. Because for example, if you have a website and you go to and it has iframes built in, like like you do with if you embed a YouTube video or something like that, what it's going to do with the site isolation is it's going to actually separate those two elements so that they only know about each other. So it, YouTube wouldn't be able to use anything on the on the tab, tab itself as well because it's separated. So it's not even just process uh, separation and process isolation. It's the domain of whatever you're using, even if there's multiple domains being displayed to you. And that's just that's just awesome. Yeah, and they're ruling out the Firefox multi-account containers extension. Mm-hmm. This is your favorite feature. Mm-hmm. This is my favorite feature. This is out of everything else why it's almost impossible to get away from Firefox because they're the only ones with this feature is the container tabs that they have. But with this feature, they're rolling out an extension with Mozilla VPN integration that lets you use a different server location for each container tab setup you have. Awesome. So I have one called Google Crap. It opens a container. That's the name of it. Literally is Google crap. (laughs) But I could have that attached to a different VPN location, even though it's already contained as my other stuff for maybe Linux show notes that I have a container tab, which you connect to a different location. That's a really cool idea. That That is very cool. I mean, Aww. I also love the fact that they're making more, you know, doing stuff more for the container tabs because it's such a Absolutely. good feature. And it's, it's, it's for me, like Ryan said, it's, it's the thing that makes me use Firefox even more so than like other browsers are, you know, there are things that I, I'm tempted to use other browsers. I, I like, you know, there's some cool features that other browsers have, but then I think about it like, can I actually switch? Uh, no. Because container yeah. tabs are so amazing that I also like Firefox in general, but it, they're so amazing. And the fact that they're actually doing extra work to make them even better. Yes, please. Thank you. This is what we've been saying for Firefox, though, is is stop with those other updates. The last release was just, this is yeah. what you need to focus on. This is what's Security. going to build a market for Firefox outside of what Chrome and other things are doing. And that's focusing on this privacy and security area, which by the way, it's funny because a lot of big corporations are like, yeah, but you lose all this money and all this stuff. If you go in the privacy security and we can't take data and these type of things, but look how like even companies who faked it to a degree, like Apple have done, they have made billions off of this idea of privacy and security. They have carved them out and made the public believe all, you know, down everybody believes that apple now is the privacy who are not technically inclined is the privacy company the privacy devices Mm -hmm. that you want to go to because of their marketing and things out there they have literally built an entire market off of their products on that advertisement firefox could do the same things what i'm saying but actually honestly in the browser market (laughs) of peeling themselves out into being the privacy and security focused browser out there. And I think there's billions of dollars to be made in that type of a market and focus because people are waking up more than ever before. I hear more, I see more tweets and Mastodon posts and everything else about people deleting their Facebook and stuff for the first time ever. It's really starting to take a uh, importance in people's minds and Firefox should be there to pick that up. I want to see every release as good as this one. Have you ever, you know, the, the top or H top tools for terminal things to monitor your process? Have you ever thought, wouldn't it be cool instead of processes, it was cryptocurrencies? Every <laughs> single day of my life. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so that's what Cointop is. So, but real quick, we, that we are not financial advisors. This is not advice for any kind of financial thing. We are people on the internet who are just saying, this is kind of cool. So if you want to check it out, then check out Cointop. So basically, it allows you to have be able to track cryptocurrencies. You can also put in stuff like your setup portfolio of different things that you have, or track your favorite <laughs> track your favorite currencies. And for those who are not watching the video, uh, Ryan is trying to show you this mug where it's, that says uh, uh, diamond, "Diamond Hands, hands. and to the Moon." Yeah. <laughs> total, total, <laughs> total for sure. Yes. Uh, but also, it's a, it's a flat pack app, so it makes it really easy for anybody to get started with it. So if you are interested in having your own uh, c- cryptocurrency terminal interface similar to Top and HTOP, check out Cointop. 
I love this tool. Like I've been looking for a way to manage and see all of the cryptocurrency and how it's going throughout the day and having it in a terminal. It just looks cooler, number one. But you can actually, this is a really neat, this is kind of like WeChat in a way that I, for IRC mm. and that there's a bunch of configurations mm. you can do. Like I can set up my whole portfolio of the coins I have and how much money I have in them and all through this app. So it's not just one that just sits there and displays the price change, but you can do it in relation to your actual portfolio. It's a really cool app. I enjoy the heck out of using it. Oh, that's cool. But Ryan, does it allow you to track the memory usage of the cryptocurrencies? Like top <laughs> and H top? That'd be interesting. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. That, that, that is a failure. But uh, to me, coin top's way more useful because my machines cool. generally don't run out of resources ever. Well, I mean, we, we'll, just, we'll just send a feature request to him. <laughs> yeah. There you yeah. Go. This week in our tips and tricks, we're going to get you started with managing your data, keeping track of it, backing up. We had somebody write in and said, hey, I tried to take control of my data and it bit me in the tuckus. So we're going to start from the beginning or work our way through. I'm going to recommend you start with Dolphin now. And Dolphin is one of my favorite file managers. And we'll talk about why that is as we go on. But one of the features that you have is the ability to do a split screen. And so what Dolphin will do is split the Dolphin window and you'll have two essentially Dolphin windows inside of one file browser window. And what that's going to allow you to do is open your source files in one window and your destinations on the other. Now, on the left-hand side of Dolphin, you're going to see uh, the bookmarks, places menu. And there is a way where you can just simply drag a folder over to the bookmarks and have that at at the ready at quick access. And so we're in, we've installed Dolphin, we've opened up our file browser, we've uh, got launched into our split view, we've created a bookmark or a placeholder for our root directory so we can always find that place easy. And uh, towards the bottom of Dolphin, you're going to see your devices and encrypted drive. So this is where we're, if we start to plug in backup drives, flash drives, those kinds of things, we're going to see them down there. And of course, whatever window you were in last, if you're on the left side and you click on the flash drive, the flash drive is going to open on the left side of Dolphin. If you're in the right side, you click on the flash drive, it's going to open on the right side of Dolphin. And once we have our source and our destination, source on the left, destination on the right, now we can simply start dragging files over. We can copy them or we can move them to organize and manage our data. If you want previous tips and tricks, we invite you to listen to the back catalog as well as continue to come back. We'll show you more about managing your data on Destination Linux. I think it's really cute how you guys have a file manager that can tile. What if I told you if you'd come to i3WM, you could tile everything? All the things. Or tile all the awesome things. Desktop. So that's, or rat that's poison. adorable as well. But uh, so I would say that uh, just a quick note that there is an option to click this. There's a split view buttons for those who don't know where to do it. But also there's this really nice way of doing it that I, I, I forgot there was a button after I started doing. If you just hit the, the shortcut F3 while you're in Dolphin, it will split the view and you can quickly do it. And it also that's actually how you can toggle it, too. So if you want to go back to a single mode or split it, just hit F3 and you're good to go. I tried it in Nautilus. It didn't work. Oh. <laughs> Did you miss the part where I said you need dolphin? Oh, my bad. Well, yeah. so here's the here's a quick history lesson. Nautilus used to be able to do this. It does it now. Really? But there are there are other file managers that can do it. It's not yeah. the dolphin's not the only one. It just happens to be the best one. Uh, as Noah said, I also agree. But there are other <laughs> options. There are other file managers that can do it. Thunark, I'm pretty sure can do it. Nemo yeah. can do it. You know, there are other options. So split view. In itself Very is a cool. tip, but also Dolphin is a fantastic file browser. Yeah, I enjoy so it. So before we exit, <laughs> I want to go over some Linux events. And there's a really amazing one going on. I want you to mark your calendars, 9 a.m. Eastern, December 13th. Um, and this is going to go on till 9 a.m. December 14th. That entire time, 24 hours, our very own Matt from DLN Extend and GameSphere is going to do a 24 hour game stream for charity. Now I know Matt mm -hmm. personally, I've known him for a long time. He works so many outrageous hours mm -hmm. in his personal life. When I tell you that he's one of the hardest working people I know, like I mean it, like this guy works every weekend, most nights, then comes in in the mornings and has to work again. He gets no breaks, but for charity and for this community, 
he decided he wanted to do a 24 hour stream in addition to help support St. Jude's Children's Hospital. So for 24 hours, he will be raising money for that December 13th through December 14th. Please mark your calendars. We will all try to make appearances there to encourage him and help him out. Um, show up on stream, show him actually how to game. Cause that's really embarrassing. Matt doesn't know how to game. So I'll show him how to game. <laughs> the pro. Um, yeah, the host but, of game sphere doesn't know how to game. So Ryan's going to yeah, help him yeah, out. The host of game sphere doesn't know. So I'll help him out there, but no, this is a very, very awesome thing he wants to do. So you can check out our discourse forum for more information. But I encourage all of you to um, try to mark that off and, and see if you could show some support. Even if you can't donate to the charity, just being there and encouraging him on, I think it's an awesome thing from somebody who, um, I don't know how he has any time to do it, but appreciate it very much that he's willing to to do that for the network and for St. Jude's Hospital. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, that when he told me he wanted to do a 24-hour stream, I was like, are you sure? And he's like, I want to do it for charity. <laughs> are you sure you want to do 24 hours, though? I'm like, yes, I'm sure. I'm going to do it. Like, mad respect for that. Because I, I yeah, think that it's the 24, like, when people think about 24 hours, it doesn't sound like a ton but when you are constantly Miserable. going it is a yeah. lot yeah. like the first 12 hours you're gonna be fine probably but then it, it just starts creeping up on you <laughs> then you start hitting those walls remember when zeb did it for the yeah exactly. i was just thinking about zeb, zeb doing showed it. us all up he made yeah. us all look like we were uh old and outdated because he was there just rocking and rolling i'm like zeb i couldn't have done it man i couldn't yeah. have done it i couldn't do it yeah zeb was a powerhouse so we'll see if matt can do the 24-hour stream so mark your I calendar got faith in you, matt. <laughs> Yes, yeah, I do too. we all do, Matt. And then mm -hmm. Fedora has a Linux 35 release party. So if you want to do some partying during the holidays and have it Linux themed, you need to go to the Fedora Linux 35 release party, which is November 12th, 8 a.m. through November 13th, 6 p.m. And it is on hoppin.com slash event slash Fedora Linux This event's going to be hopping. It's going to be hopping. Like they already <laughs> yeah. told you right in the name. It's <laughs> And also it's, there's it's, multiple different things that are planned. So that it's not like it's a continuous thing or whatever. There's multiple different, uh, ex, uh, what's the activities. There's so much room for activities in this <laughs> particular Step event. Brothers reference. Nice, man. <laughs> yeah. So this isn't a 24 hour thing. They just have different starting November 12th at 8 AM. You'll have events November yep. 12th and then you'll have events November 13th ending at 6 PM. November 13th will be the last event there. So continue. Think about going and checking that out and supporting that party and going and partying with some Linux geeks. I mean, what could be funner than that? Exactly. So a huge thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us by watching or listening. However you do it, we love your faces. And if you want more DL, you become a patron like all the amazing people in the 65,000 or more square virtual stadium that we have where they get to listen to the show with real-time audio and like YouTube and other stuff that delay it. Plus, they get unedited versions of the show and all kinds of perks like that. So you can go check it out. Consider becoming a patron. Plus, they get to hang out with us after the show in the patron hangouts room. In addition, every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we're now live at DLNlive.com. The best part, everyone is invited to watch the recording of Destination Linux each and every week. We can't wait to see you in the chat. And I don't know if you heard the feedback we got earlier in the show, but if you didn't, uh -huh. I just want to remind you that what, he, what Russ was saying is that you could get your own Destination Linux mug and it will hold every single, single type of liquid Known to mankind, that including that brains, even including line? including apparently some dos geek brains that I put in here for some reason. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I couldn't tell if it was a line. <laughs> well, you can get your own DLN mug by going to dlnstore.com. You can also get t shirts, hoodies, uh, stickers, backpacks, aprons, so many great things at dlnstore.com. And make sure to check out all our awesome shows here on the Destination Linux Network. We have the Pseudo Show, the Ask Noah Show, This Week in Linux, the DOS Geek Channel, DLN Extend, Hardware Addicts, Game Sphere, and get your Fedora hat on with the Fedora Podcasts. And everyone head to destinationlinux.network and subscribe to all of these great shows. And please don't forget to leave a rating on your favorite app so that others can discover the power of open source and keep those penguins marching in the full Monty of Linux and open source awesome sauce. And everybody have a great week. And remember that the journey itself is just as important as the destination. Thanks, everyone. See you Bye. next week.